Well, let me welcome to the program, Christian, uh, Kristen Van Uden from Sophia Institute Press. Hey, Kristen, great to have you on. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so Kristen, uh, I was very excited to learn that Sophia Institute Press was publishing a book uh, in two ways. The first, not pub that's not what I was excited. I was excited they were publishing a book on the rosary and by Father Delindo Ruotolo. And um, it's, I, I find that, uh, and I want to get into both of these things uh, about you, but uh, Father Ruotolo um, has a very interesting marketing team in heaven because he lived a, 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 his, his whole life somewhat unknown to uh, people around the world. But I, it feels like in the last maybe five years, maybe 10 years, he has started to uh, become much more familiar to the Western world uh, and to the Catholic world around the world. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, definitely. I'm glad that you've heard of him. Uh, it's always kind of sometimes about half and half about whether people have heard of him or not. And I think that is in large part due to the fact that he has since been declared a uh, servant of God. So his cause for canonization has been officially opened. And he was one of those those individuals in the 20th century who just flew under the radar. He was, of course, very contemplative and very devoted to the rosary. And so he was also considered a victim soul. So much of his suffering and work for the church was in private and behind closed doors. Uh, he was a contemporary of St. Padre Pio and Padre Pio actually called Father Delindo a living saint. So some words of high praise from the marketing team, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Father uh, Saint Padre Pio was was saying, "Look, it's time to bring this other priest out into into the open." Um, have you are you familiar at all? And we're here to talk about meditations on the Holy Rosary, which is this beautiful gathering. Um, they seem to be almost entirely like short letters to um, spiritual directees um, or uh, sermon, sections of sermons, and a couple of places also, clips of his writings that are all connected to uh, the Holy Rosary um, and or to the Blessed Mother and the mysteries that are covered in, in the Holy Rosary. But I think Father Ruotolo has become um, more well-known because of uh, his famous prayer, Jesus, you take over. Uh, are That's you familiar right. with that? Uh, sometimes it's it's in the form of a novena, but mm -hmm. the the Jesus you take over prayer. Are you familiar with that at all? I am. Yeah, the surrender novena is, has been one of my favorites, and it's actually been one of our most popular articles on Catholic Exchange, where I'm editor. Is just you you say that on each bead of the rosary, Jesus you take over, and it's a practice of handing over your will to God, and as the title suggests, surrendering your will to God. So. It's, re it's really something that's quite a comfort in any challenge in life is just realizing that it is okay to give up, so to speak, in, in that you're giving up your will to God and you're handing over that, that power to him where it rightly belongs. And that's the only way that you can truly act with free will as if you, um, to do the good is the freedom to choose the good. So by entrusting yourself to God in that way, and especially by connecting that to the rosary, I think was such a great contribution of Don Delindo. You know, uh, Kristen, what you just said there, that's a theme that does get woven through his book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary, uh, is that theme of consent, that, that theme of the surrender that's involved in those words, behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to thy word. That, that theme seems to show up quite a bit. Um, and I, I hadn't connected it to the surrender prayer and you call it the surrender novena i i found um a like a version of it that was just a recording and i have sent that to so many people who are in i want to say um like very almost like traumatized conditions mm -hmm. right they're literally overwhelmed by what they're facing and it's so hard to put uh, oneself uh, to, to, to be able to speak. I know this personally, when, when I've been in the most like, overwhelmed conditions, it's hard for me to pray. And so one of the gifts of Father uh, Ruotolo is his ability to have the moment of prayer be a moment where Jesus is speaking to the soul. 
And, um, and so that when Jesus is, is speaking in that surrender prayer, and that's surrender novena, um, he is calling us to, like he's, he's, he's kind of putting into us the words that we can then speak back to him. You know, Jesus, I, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. It, it is, it's very powerful because it's like you're getting carried along in prayer. Does that make sense to you? Definitely. And I like how you emphasize this conversational aspect of prayer, because that's something that Father Delindo emphasizes throughout the book, where in each of the meditations on the mysteries for each of the sets of mysteries, he actually organizes it as a conversation between Jesus and the soul. So Jesus will have, will speak directly to the soul. This is how Father Delindo writes it. And then there's actually a response that the person who is praying can say either out loud or just in their heart or just meditate and reflect on where it's really anchoring in the soul the fact that you do have participation in this it's internal it's the true meaning of participation is a an orienting of your will and intellect towards god but really forcing you to think of of your prayer your supplication to god as a two-way conversation where you are becoming completely open to receiving what messages and what will God has for you. And also you're constantly reminding yourself and constantly making that statement, that act of the will that you are surrendering to God throughout this entire uh, act of the prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, Krista, I, I love what you said there. And in some ways what you're doing in this interview with me is just kind of exemplifying how Father Delindo Rutolo writes in the book. Um, what I mean is, uh, you speak on behalf of the author because the author isn't there to speak. Uh, I had to admit, I'm like, oh, meditations on the Holy Rosary by Father Rutolo. <laughs> Maybe I get to interview him. And I'm like, no, right. he's, he's <laughs> no, not quite not. available right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you're a stand-in. How does that feel to, to stand in and, uh, for Father Rutolo and, and to, to bring out into the open the riches of this book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary? What's that like as a job? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's such a great privilege. I am our media spokesperson for all of our dead authors. So it's a tremendous uh, privilege and responsibility, I think. So I, we're, we're lucky to reprint quite a lot from the church's treasury of classic books. So a lot of preconciliar reprints. This one originally, even though Don DeLindo died before this, it was published in the 1990s as a compendium of his writings. And uh, we also have a few foreign authors who give us uh, the rights to do their their promotions here in here in America. And so, yeah, these these are messages that need to be heard. I find that the classic reprints are often to me the most compelling because they do not mince words. <laughs> these these priests from from 50, 60 years ago and beyond, we even had I think our oldest reprint so far is from St. Robert Bellarmine, a doctor of the church. So these are import, important important works that are timeless and that have fed the faith of millions of Catholics, generations of Catholics before us. And so to be able to bring them to a new audience is such a tremendous gift. And I'm really grateful to be able to read Catholic books, which I'm going to be doing anyway for a living. So it's a dream job that has really uh, inflated my library at home. And I have you know, stacks of books, even in my car at this point, but <laughs> these are good problems to have. <laughs> Kristen, you get paid to read awesome Catholic books. Uh, that, I what a gift. That's pretty yep. cool. <laughs> I got the wrong job. I, I, I want your job. So that exactly. is wonderful. There you go. You're on the way. <laughs> I, I'm on the way. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Kristen, uh, again, I'm talking with Kristen Van Uden and she's with Sophia Institute Press. And you, you highlighted the fact that you, you, that's really the heart of the mission of Sophia Institute Press. Like when I think about the call that we have as Catholic Christian disciples of Jesus, uh, one of the essential um, elements is tradition. And a way of understanding tradition is to hand over to others that which we have received. Um, St. Saint, Saint Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3, talks about that I, first of all, my brothers have handed on to you what I myself received. And, and it was the gospel, right? It was, there was the essence of the gospel message. And in some ways, I think that we've lost sight of that. We, we live in a time today that focuses quite a bit on the future, right? The answers lie in the future. They're just around the next corner. Once we get the next 
te uh, technological, scientific discovery. We're going to get the breakthrough we need, and that's going to give us the answer to today's problem. And I think we miss something very important if we lose sight of the, the Catholic principle of tradition that, you know what, the answer may not be in the future, it may be in the past. And if we can recover, if we can welcome, if we can uh, appropriate that which has been presented, that which has been presented to us in our tradition, there might be a richness there that is surprising and frankly, life changing, that, that is transformative. And so um, I, I love the mission of Sophia Institute Press, which in some ways is in, uh, embodying or expressing the, the Catholic principle of, of tradition. Let's, let's go back into the, the, the riches, let's bring them out into the open, and let's present them in a fresh way for an audience that probably hasn't, uh, hasn't had that, uh, the gift of that encounter before. Exactly. That's very well put. And I'm reminded of that Gustav Mahler quote that tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. And that's exactly what it is. The church does not move. The world moves. The church stays the same. The cross is the, the fulcrum about which the world turns. And this is how you know it's true, because truth is objective. And despite the world changing and various heresies coming and going and the zeitgeist of the time being more or less <laughs> sinful, we know the devil is the prince of this world and that the church is the bark of Peter and the, the only antidote, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And so we, it, it is very just psychologically calming to know that the truth is always the truth is always the truth. And no matter where you go in the world, the mass, the truth of the church, truly universal, not only in terms of being everywhere throughout the world, but also in principle universal as whole and inviolate. So the meaning of communion is to participate in the exact same faith as Catholics throughout the world, but also as all of the saints. So this is the unity that we have between the church triumphant in heaven, the church suffering in purgatory, and us, the church militant here on earth. So that's exactly what, what it is. And when, um, when we present these Kristen, books for I'm going to say God. this, <laughs> Kristen, sounds like you've had a lot of theology. You don't just, you, you're uh, talking in a way that, that shows a, a, a real uh, ease of speaking really profound truths. So I want to learn yeah. a little bit more about your, your background here. Uh, Cause it, you know, they don't just throw anyone into a position <laughs> to say media <laughs> spokesman on behalf of these amazing <laughs> books and authors. And then yeah. you come on and you start like, speaking forth these really beautiful truths in with an ease. I love it. Where did you come from? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, no pressure, right? Like I uh, got some big yeah, shoes. Now, now how do you but... respond to that, right? Come on, let's yeah. go. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely like an amateur in theology, but I was blessed to go to Catholic school my whole life. And then I studied history. And so very much focused upon these, these principles and big themes skills of writing, public speaking, et cetera. And I think my, my main driver my entire life has been discovering truth at all costs and promoting and then speaking the truth, boiling down very complicated information into something that is digestible and understandable. So my background- okay, Now you said at all costs, why at all costs? Give me an example of <laughs> a truth that has cost you something. Yeah, well, I mean, as, as Jesus says, the entire world is not worth one soul. And what may it merit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his own soul. So really meditating on the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell has helped me put this all in perspective. And that the object of this life is to get to heaven and to bring as many people there as possible. And through your particular vocation, especially to sanctify those around you. And so I, I've definitely lost lots of friendships in my life, relationships, opportunities because of being Catholic. But Jesus told us, this is not going to be easy. We're going to suffer. We're always countercultural as Catholics. And if the world is liking you, that's almost sometimes a sign that something's wrong. So <laughs> it, it's a difficult truth to hear. And Jesus told us, I came not to bring peace, but the sword, because he knew that his truth, the doctrine he was teaching was divisive to those who were mired in either pride or worldliness or just somehow otherwise unable to hear his truth and the truth. <clears throat> Kristen, what you just said, uh, it sounded like you were listening to my radio program yesterday. Really? I'm serious. <laughs> I, 
I cannot believe it because we was I was reflecting on the feast of Saint Alphonsus de Liguori, talking about like you live, especially preparation for death, and you live life here in the light of the world to come, and then the Sunday's readings, right? Vanity of vanities, and then put your uh, let your mind be raised with Christ to the things that are above, and then the the gospel about. Don't let the bigger grain bins, you know, fool you. Your soul is going to be required of you. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it profit a man? And and I said, uh, I said, I mean, really, I said on the, I said in my program, you know, this is a whole way of seeing the world and has to be formed. And it's, it's the truths of our faith that form this way of seeing, and then you show up. So, and <laughs> you start talking <laughs> like yeah, this is true. This this actually works. This isn't, folks. This is not a setup. I, I did not know Kristen was going to talk <laughs> like this. Uh, so, yeah. uh, that's that's the, that is so wow. Uh, that is very very beautiful. Um, and so I, I'm actually going to bring this to your attention. So, uh, right. folks, uh, Kristen Van Uden works for uh, Sophia Institute Press, and you'll see um, the website sophiainstitute.com. Uh, on that page, you'll see a number of books, including the wonderful book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary. When you click on it, you're going to get to a beautiful page that shows you not only the book right here and describes it in detail, but there's also a wonderful set, Meditations on the Holy Rosary set, that uh, Sophia Institute is offering right now. So I'm going to encourage you, folks, if, if you are blessed by the surrender prayer or the surrender novena of Father Delindo Ruotolo and and you are struck by that way of engaging in prayer where Jesus is speaking to the soul. It's it's reminiscent of the imitation of Christ. It's reminiscent of Heart of the World by Hans Urs von Balthasar. There are some writers in the in, in our tradition who have um, taken that on as a, um, as a as a mode of writing to speak to uh, the, the reality of prayer and to help us engage in prayer. So if you're blessed by that, I encourage you to pick up this book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary by uh, Father Delindo Ruotolo. Um, Kristen, I've got a question. So as I was reading this, um, uh, as I was reading through uh, this book of Meditations on the Holy Rosary, and there was that style that showed up because I wasn't familiar with writings of Father Ruotolo beyond the novena prayer, the, the surrender prayer. Um, I was wondering, were the writings where Jesus spoke this way, um, a kind of interior locution, kind of like uh, Catherine of Siena's interior dialogue, or was it a more uh, poetic spiritual flourish that was, uh, well, let me see, how do I make this point? Well, let me put these words into Jesus's mouth because that will be a technique that will be fresh and will get the job done. So, uh, or was it something else? Yeah, that's a good question where you wish the author was here himself to talk about his internal thought process because as far as I'm reading it, I think it's the second option that you mentioned where Father Delindo uses this as a, a literary device in order to really anchor these these principles and the messages he's trying to get across but of course we do know that part of father delindo's life was that he was a mystic and so he had he had reached this state of unity with god where he was given um i'm not sure to what degree these are incorporated but where he was given these these revelations and of course they'll never contradict doctrine and they'll never contradict revelation with a big r and what we know to be true through the church's teaching but he did have this other special mystical characteristic to his own spirituality mm -hmm. so it's unclear just from reading how much of that comes through from his own personal mystical prayer life and how much of this is just the device that he uses in order to reach his spiritual directees and to get these truths across to them yeah it's uh I I was wondering myself, right, as I was reading through these, and there were a couple of points where he describes the idea of interior communication, mm -hmm. um, especially it's in the two main reflections towards the end of the book, the meditations on the Holy Rosary, where he describes the Annunciation and the Visitation. And these seem to be the two primary mysteries in terms of the amount of uh, attention and, and, and writing that he did on them and reflecting on them on his life um, that 
he describes the way in which the angel communicated or no mary does right mary yeah. in the in the in the words in the from the standpoint of mary the blessed mother describes what it was like when the archangel gabriel came to her and spoke that it wasn't she heard words in her ears but there was this sense of spiritual communication to her mind and she knew what was being asked of her and i wondered whether that was him giving us a little glimpse into how the lord communicated to him um, that's a good point yeah i'm glad you bring that up because it calls to mind another recent book that we published with sophia that i'm representing called visions and revelations by uh, father gabriel of saint mary magdalene who was a uh, discalced uh carmelite i believe and so he wrote this book about 1950 and it was for spiritual directors who might have students of theirs who are experiencing visions and revelations. And he draws heavily from St. Teresa of Avila, of course, and St. John of the Cross, who were experts on visions and revelations and of course, mystics themselves. And when he's speaking about St. Teresa of Avila, and you'll see this in her own writings in the interior castle as well, they describe several types of imbued knowledge. And so you can have locutions, which are heard either exteriorly through the ear or just in either the imagination or the intellect and the same for visions with the eyes and so what they mean by imagination is not that these are fake or illusory but rather that they exist operating upon the faculty of the imagination so that's within that's seeing like saint uh, blessed Anne catherine emmerich for example had these very almost cinematic visions of the stories of the bible and the lives of the saints where you know you see it as uh, in time as something that is happening and so that can exist for both the visual and the lo uh, locutions they can either be they can be within each of those three stages and also one analogy that saint Teresa of avila used that really struck me was she describes imbued knowledge as if you food appeared in your stomach without you having actually eaten it <laughs> so it's similar with knowledge it appears in your soul or a conviction appears in your intellect will or mind without you having done the work to get there and that's uh directly placed there by god and it's imbued grace Wow, man, you're impressive. I, Kristen, you. I like, man, you're flexing on me now. Okay, you're just kind of bringing up all these other books. Oh yeah, and then a quite a lot. Of this and then uh, Chris, that's Kristen Van Uden who's with me today on the program talking about this beautiful book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary by Father Delindo Ruotolo, uh, famous for his um, Jesus, you take over prayer and surrender novena. But today we're talking about the meditations on the Holy Rosary. He actually talked about uh, the experience uh, in, in his meditation on the visitation at the very beginning. Do you remember what he says uh, at the beginning of that? Uh, like, where did my homily come from yesterday? And let's see, how does he say it oh, here? Yeah, he says, I shall write today what I can remember of the sermon I gave yesterday. I go to the pulpit completely empty almost always. I don't even know the subject on which I am supposed to preach. All is fruit of grace for the intimate light I feel when I start talking. All of there it, it is. That beautiful part. right there, that, yeah. that grace. The intimate light I feel when I start talking. Mm -hmm. There's something that's so trusting in that, right? It's Definitely. like, I, I don't know what I'm going to say next, but <laughs> I know I'm, I'm, I'm here. I've got that mission to give this homily. Uh, and then here it is. And it's, it's, it's trusting that the next word will come. The next sentence will come. The next thought will come. The next idea will come. That's putting yourself out there. That is that concept of consent to the will of God. And I'm sorry, I cut you off. There's a, there's the next, we can finish the paragraph. It's so beautiful. Oh yeah. So then he, he finishes by saying there remains with me only my confusion and a profound feeling of my own nothingness. So very clearly, like you said, giving over his will to God and asking the Holy spirit to inspire his words, really an embodiment of what we hear in the Our father of give us this day, our daily bread, relying on God for each of these needs at every point, no matter how small they may seem. And also no matter how large and important they may seem. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that this lovely book meditations on the Holy rosary, it gives, um, some, 
so, some new, for me, new insights into the person of Father Delindo Rutolo. Uh, I, and again, I, my sense is that um, the Lord wants to hold him in reserve just for me to be to ex experience the blessings of him as an intercessor. Nobody else, right? That's no, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Kristen, I'm like, how far are you going to agree with me on this? That is not, I, I it just, it, it, it's, I sense that the Lord wants to bring him out into the open as this beautiful intercessor for our time, a time that it, it's hard to consent. It's hard to trust. It's difficult to uh, uh, realize those attitudes in, in the contemporary moment where we seek so much control. So I, he points to the, to the blessing of praying the rosary um, and uses some powerful ways of describing the, the blessing that the rosary is, but he does something that's different than in other books I've read on the rosary. And that is he describes these sort of stages of going deeper, these stages of being led deeper into the experience of the rosary itself as you're praying each Hail Mary, as you're going through the different mysteries. There's some really new, for me, new ways of um, uh, understanding um, the gift that the rosary is. And again, I think he's really bringing out into the open his own experience of the rosary and talks as if, well, this is going to be everyone's experience, almost well, it could be everyone's experience of the rosary. Did you have that experience when you were reading the book? Well, there were definitely some new to me conceptualizations of the rosary as well. It, right from the beginning, he, he titles his first chapter or one of the first chapters, the richness of the rosary. So he was right away tackling the misconceptions about the rosary and facing head on the challenge that many people feel when they approach the rosary of thinking it's either boring or repetitive, etc. And he lays those misconceptions to rest right off the bat by giving some very beautiful imagery. And the first one that struck me was that the rosary is like musical variations. Mm -hmm. So he discusses how each Hail Mary is like an individual note in a symphony that taken together paint this beautiful picture of salvation history as the classic 15 decade rosary, which was supposed to be said every day, all 15 decades paints from the Annunciation all the way until Mary being um, crowned as queen of heaven. So this is the entire arc of Jesus Christ's life, death and resurrection and of our salvation all contained within the rosary. And so each Hail Mary when taken apart may just seem like one individual note if you had listened to a symphony cut up like that. But when you realize the full picture and what you're building towards, it becomes clear. And actually I learned the other day that in some countries in Eastern Europe, when they say the rosary, they interject into each Hail Mary, a little snippet of the mystery. So there'll be about a sentence or a paragraph about the mystery. So for the visitation, it could be something like, Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth who said, hail Mary full of grace, et cetera. And they'll put the first couple, they'll put the first line of that in the first Hail Mary, the next line in the second Hail Mary and so on. So that by the time you've prayed that decade, you've actually said everything that happened in the mystery. And that's just a really interesting way to, to reify and to make more concrete the uh, the meditation on the mystery. That Did you just saying. use the word reify? Yeah, it's a very, it's kind of a pretentious Kristen, who word, are you? Like... Yo, okay, now you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to define the word reify. Folks are listening and they're like, what did she just real. say? It means, Thank it means you. To take something out of the abstract and to make it real. And yeah, it's kind of like a pretentious word, but it really like gets across the meaning that I was going for. So That's great. You'd be a lot of fun at parties, Kristen. I'm telling you, this is yeah, good. Yeah, I've got this lots of, of stories. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have to ask a question. Sure. Um, so, and that is the the relationship that you have with the rosary or the, mm -hmm. the relationship that the rosary has to your own spiritual life. Because uh, we're here talking about this beautiful book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary by Father Delindo Ruotolo. It's published by Sophia Institute Press. I encourage you to, again, go and check it out for yourself, sophiainstitute.com, and, uh, and see the other beautiful books they have there. Um, and for me, and the reason I ask is this, is that you don't get fasting unless you fast. Mm -hmm. It's only through the, the actual experience and, and the entering into participating in the reality that the richness of what is there is made known, right? Uh, it's, uh, I would rather experience contrition than to know how to define it, right? Yeah, the imitation yeah. of Christ. So, um, 
so the reality of the rosary, tell me about the rosary and Kristen's life. Sure. So the rosary is responsible for basically what, what feels like a conversion in my life. So it brought me to the traditional Latin mass and to discover traditional Catholicism, which has been my, the past two years or so, um, has really reinvigorated my spiritual life and my understanding of not only the current crisis in the church, but also just my identity as a child of God. So it, uh, I, yeah, I would say, um, the, the greatest interaction I've had with the rosary is a 54 day rosary novena, which I'm constantly saying I would highly recommend those that I started just randomly over the summer a couple of years ago for uh, just random spiritual direction. And it just happened to end on the feast of Our Lady of Victory in October. Mm -hmm. And that's when the spiritual re resurgence in my life happened. And so we are reminded also by Don DeLindo in this book that the rosary is a tool of spiritual warfare. It is a weapon against the devil. And the Feast of Our Lady of Victory emphasizes that because of the literal victory in battle that Our Lady won for Catholics at that um, and, battle. And you remember, the, uh, you remember his image of the each bead is like a bullet. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And so He's, how dare well, anybody call it boring, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and, and he, I love the way he talked about Satan is just defeated and flees in fear from the rosary. Yeah, exactly. But continue, so, please. I'd love to hear more. So, yeah, I certainly go through my periods of forgetting to pray or falling asleep while praying, but you have to force yourself to do it because the devil will do everything he can to get you to not pray the rosary because, he, as you said, knows how powerful it is. So whether you have to pray in the car or use a YouTube video with sacred art, which I like doing, or use a book like this to help you to pray it, there's there's no, you don't have to worry about being exactly perfect. You don't have to come to some new breakthrough in, in meditations on the mysteries every time. The important thing is that you get through the rosary and that you say it. And I I would definitely recommend to try to say 15 decades a day if you can. I, I you know personally when I have been able to do that, you see the fruits in your life. And so just just say it. There's no need to be a perfectionist about it. And you know, this is advice I am giving myself too at the moment. So uh, don't worry if you if you feel that you're not saying it perfectly, if you say it with the correct intent and piety and openness to to learn from God about this beautiful devotion and his will for you, then you're you're fulfilling those requirements. Amen. That's Kristen Van Uden with Sophia Institute Press talking with me today about meditations on the Holy Rosary by Father Delindo Ruotolo. Kristen, would you go to the first meditation that where Mary speaks to the soul? It's actually the second one in the book. The first two, by the way, are just, you come out of the gate strong. I mean, the, the book is amazing. Those first two meditations where Jesus speaks to the soul and Mary speaks to the soul are very powerful. But I know, uh, and the reason I'm doing this, Kristen, is that there are a lot of folks listening to the program who are um, intent on and committed to praying a daily rosary with their family. Mm -hmm. And, and, and sometimes it just becomes an ideal or when it becomes practiced, we experience the lack of fruit, the frustration that can happen in um, um, not all the kiddos are kneeling uh, in prayer, saying the Hail Mary in Latin, and the glory of God is not shining forth behind their head. Mm -hmm. This is not the experience. And so uh, I, I love what the Blessed Mother says. And so do you mind just reading that? Sure. So this is, remind me which page this one's on. Uh, on page eight. Page eight. Okay. <clears throat> Is it the bright cloud of spirituality? Sorry, oh. this is, uh, it says when uh, Mary, oh, Mary speaks to the soul. Sorry, I don't have my glasses on here. Okay. Oh, page five. <laughs> See, oh, okay. well, there it that's is why I'm page. having you read it because there I have to have go. my glasses like, on to read on it. Page eight. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Mary speaks to the soul. When you pray the rosary, my child, remain near me with all your heart. It is a time for you to converse with your mother. When you let your mind wander, you are no longer speaking to me, but to the creatures that go through your mind. Every Hail Mary is a flower of your soul. Your distractions tear away the petals, and then only a thorny stem remains. The mysteries are the perfume of the flower, and if you do not meditate on them, you will have a flower with colors, but without fragrance. Be fervent and loving when you pray the rosary, because without your filial love, the rose you offer to me is artificial. It is a paper flower. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about upping the game. 
Yes. Right. When in terms of saying every Hail Mary is an opportunity to say it well with the intention, to say it well, to use the the concept of meditation, to say it, and to think that there's a difference between the raw repetition and performing of a rosary and the uh, the the potential of offering to the Blessed Mother a perfumed flower rather than a, a bunch of thorns or a paper flower. To, to just stop and say, that's what's at stake in the rosary that you're about to pray. That was grabbing to me. Exactly. It gives you a great responsibility, but also reminds you of how important prayer is and how important your own soul is. It's not something to take a blase attitude towards and have as an afterthought, but really to make prayer a central component of your day and to realize that it is more important than work or school or any activities that you have and does not deserve to be sidelined is definitely a wake up call. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. So I want to uh, have you read the first one where Jesus speaks to the soul because that one to go from that one of this is what the rosary can be. Mm -hmm. And I think if some parents uh, get that or hear that now you need to hear what Jesus speaks to the soul about the rosary. Cause I found this one, Again, it was, a, it was a little bit convicting, but also comforting. Mm -hmm. So Jesus speaks to the soul. If you want to live a holy life, cultivate devotion to Mary and your family. Gather your children in prayer and in the recitation of the Holy Rosary. In the manner of a loving parent, help your children feel the beauty of family prayer. Never be anxious and severe, my child, because that will not inspire, but confuse them. Peace and sweetness achieve much more than impatience and outbursts. You can easily become anxious and discouraged, but no, my child, have faith in me and everything will be all right. I bless you. He finishes. Yeah, that was a little too convicting for me because uh, <laughs> my kiddos, uh, so my wife Carrie and I have nine kids. And oh, wow. um, when we pray the, the our family rosary, um, the kids would bring up that occasionally for a certain windows of time, uh, the threatened punishment for not praying the rosary well was praying another rosary oh. and and they're and they're saying dad you do realize that what you're just telling us is the rosary is a punishment and <laughs> i'm like oh yeah that's probably not the in impression right. i'm trying to get here so uh his call Jesus is call, and again this is that that way of launching in the book meditations on the holy rosary it's a it's very father father ruotolo like father delindo would that that strikes me as very much in accord with the spirit of of the surrender prayer it's um it's approaching a, a sense of peace you know again peace and, and sweetness and kindness and, and encouragement um and it's hard to to be there at the end of the day when little energy is left and the kids are grumbling and to gently shepherd them along is not an easy task so mm -hmm. I, I find this book to be um wonderfully wonderfully convicting definitely and I, I like the balance you struck between the almost the carrot versus the stick method where it's the same with really living the catholic life is that yes we fear going to hell and that's a great motivator but also just as this first meditation makes clear it's almost as if you're meditating on heaven and thinking oh yeah i want to go to heaven <laughs> it's going to be beautiful there and there are like, many good things obviously and so by by using both of those frameworks to approach every act that you make as a Christian, including the way that you approach your daily prayer, is an important reminder to not just act out of fear, but ultimately be acting out of love and acting out of love for Jesus. Yes. So my um, my oldest daughter is twenty two, mm -hmm. and. Um, so she lives, uh, out, out of the home. She lives with a bunch of other, um, a wonderful women of faith. And, um, she wrote me recently, just a few days ago, she said, uh, praying the rosary every day is life changing. Mm -hmm. I wish I could tell my Protestant friends that they can just pray the rosary when they're struggling with something. Thank you for making us pray the rosary as a family. Family rosary is so vital. That's awesome. Good and I'm job. like, who are you? <laughs> you? Where did that come from? You know, and it's yeah. like, that's something that, um, it, you know, if, if 
you could have seen her through all of the years growing up in the home, how she engaged in praying the rosary. It wasn't that she was always, you know, it wasn't that she was, a, you know, a negative Nancy, but that mm -hmm. there, that would not have come out of her mouth. What, mm -hmm. what just came out there. So I think that there is a way in which there's a sense of trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord's timing that seeds are being sown in the hearts and minds of kids uh, and in your family that will bear fruit later. It, it may not come to pass so immediately, but it'll bear fruit later. Um, and so having books like Meditations on the Holy Rosary can be things that will augment, that will help foster um, a greater sense of openness and a greater ability to enter into the praying of the rosary. Right. And the rosary has even been known to inspire great conversions too, from as far out as you can imagine, just being reeled back by God. So really to encourage all of your friends to just start praying it because then let God take over and do the rest. It's, it's you know, one of the most powerful prayers in the church. Yeah. I say that it's a, it's the devotion that has the greatest sense of discrepancy between the experience of praying it and the powerful fruit it brings hmm. uh, because the, the experience of praying it um, for those who are not will willingly with great devotion and fervor entering into it, it still can bear fruit that goes beyond anything that you could have um, manufactured or imagined on your own. That's one of the beautiful things that I've found is that when even, even just out of raw obedience, the kids are there praying the rosary, that there's a fruit that the Lord can be knitting in the hearts of my kids, a kind of unity and, and, and openness to each other and to God that just wasn't there before praying. And, and again, the kids maybe wouldn't connect the two, but it's a real thing. It's a real beautiful fruit. Yeah, that is beautiful. And right, the power of prayer is not in our own feeling or experience of it. It's in God and the graces that he gives to us through that prayer. So even if you're, even if you're praying and you don't feel good or you're not, you know, like f having, having these, the, these divine experiences that that doesn't matter. It's just, you, you do it anyway. And that's how you demonstrate your faith. And mm -hmm. many times in life that will, you'll, that feeling will be absent, but you're still gaining the graces because of the acts of the will. So Kristen, I'm going to give you a chance to give us uh, your favorite section of the book, your favorite meditation, your favorite quote. I'm sure there are many, but I'm going to hold you to, to one. Again, I'm talking with Kristen Van okay. Uden. She's from mm -hmm. Sophia Institute Press. She does media interviews like this for authors that Sophia Institute Press covers that are not here. So she is their mouthpiece and she is absolutely um, certain that everything she says is a direct coming from the saint or the whole, no, I'm just kidding. That is not what she's claiming everyone. My best. <laughs> that is not, she's trying to be a faithful representative of the, of the authors that she's representing here today. Father Delindo Ruotolo's book, Meditations on the Holy Rosary. Okay. I just gave you a lot of time to find your best quote. Yes, so I, I got one. <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting something good now. So where, so where are we? Because today's Tuesday, so the Sorrowful Mysteries, and the Sorrowful Mysteries are my favorite anyway, I have picked the agony in the garden, and this really emphasizes the theme of trust we've been discussing. So Jesus says, fulfill the divine will in the suffering of your life, and especially in the agony of your sensitive heart. Do not become disheartened in your life. Keep your eyes on your final destination, which is heaven. Do not grieve, but trust in God and confide entirely in him. Do not become despondent, but bear all things with patience and spread peace around you. Uh, that's my favorite. <laughs> Kristen, that sounds like you. Uh, it, it really <laughs> does. Like when I talk to you about your life and, and all of this, it yeah. In fact, I underlined, uh, I underlined, uh, keep your eyes on your final destination, which mm -hmm. is heaven. Do not grieve, but trust in God and confide entirely in him. So mm -hmm. that, that. I, I, that feels like a um, uh, a theme that that runs large through the book, the meditations on the Holy Rosary, and through his, his Father Ruotolo's life. Um, but uh, that I I, uh, I concur. I, but that does strike me as a yeah. as as a quote that resonates in you. That your life in yeah. some way radiates that. 
That's so, funny that, yeah, that you can pick up on that from, <laughs> from just a short conversation. Cause definitely that I felt like he was speaking right to me of, you know, tend to, to worry about the future and to think this is an impossible situation. How is, how is Jesus going to handle this? Mary undoer of knots is another, a favorite of mine that really helps with, with these specific worries of just looking at impossible situations and thinking, how could this possibly be resolved, but giving it to God and forcing yourself to give it to God. And then it's resolved in a way that you couldn't have even imagined beforehand. Amen. I love that. That's Kristen Van Uden uh, sharing with me today from Sophia Institute Press. Uh, Kristen, any, um, so this is a, the month of August has a number of beautiful Marian saints and feasts. And so it's a, it's a great month to be focused on uh, the gift of the, the, uh, the Holy Rosary and of entering into it uh, by drawing upon aids like meditations on the Holy Rosary uh, by uh, Sophia Institute Press. Uh, I want to give you a final word of encouragement to our listeners to pick up the rosary and pick up the book. Sure. So there is no better way to start developing a prayer life than the rosary because we're told through this book and through others that it is one of the most powerful spiritual weapons in the church and also one of the greatest consolations to the soul and can gain great graces for you, for others, for the souls in purgatory, for the entire church. And Our Lady of Fatima told us as, a, as an imperative to pray the rosary every day. So it's, it's almost a responsibility that we have and it's um, I would definitely recommend 54 day rosary novenas as well. It can seem daunting at first, but if you're praying the rosary every day anyway, might as well add an intention on top of it. Um, and this book has been helpful. Not only we didn't really get to show this, but in the meditations, but also the illustrations. So each page is quite beautifully illustrated. I like to have sacred art while I'm meditating on the mysteries just helps um, me to, to ground that. And so this is a book I would say you can keep your whole life. It's under 200 pages. It's not something you have to read cover to cover, but it's meant more as a devotional aid as you say the rosary and as you learn more about the mysteries. So this is available at our website, sophiainstitute.com. You'll see it probably right on the home page as a new title. Yes, it is. It's it's literally right there on the, uh, I had that already. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not only that, but right on that front page, you see it right there. Um, yep, and, and, you know, thank you for saying that about the, um, about the book that you can, um, when you open it up, there are so many beautiful images. I, I meant to bring that out. So you were inspired. There you go. In that last, <laughs> in that last thought that, um, uh, yeah, to be able to, and, and Father Ruotolo brings that up, the, mm -hmm. the ability to, to use the image to help him. And it was one of the things that, again, I learned about him. Um, was the extent of his writings. Oh, there was one last point, And that was, you mentioned at the very beginning about him that he was a victim soul, that, mm -hmm. that this holy priest of God, venerable um, Father Delindo Ruotolo, that he not only poured out his life as a holy priest of God, but all of the extensive writings that he did, his commentary on scripture, his having the stigmata and then being paralyzed for the last 10 years of his life, the last 10 years of his life. What a life. I, again, I think that this is, we're, we're moving into a time where Father Ruotolo is going to be a, playing a larger part as an intercessor uh, from heaven, that he, his life speaks to our time in, in very beautiful ways. So I think Sophia Institute Press is doing um, an important work by helping Catholics become more familiar with him. Thank you. And we actually have another book of his that was published earlier this year called The Afterlife, available on our website, where I he didn't know that. tells us, yeah, he tells us about purgatory and heaven. And the, the book is structured as a soul's ascent from purgatory through the various sufferings there into heaven and covered with church teaching, the visions of saints who were blessed. Kristen, why don't you purgatory. come on the rate? Why don't you come on my program? We can talk about yeah. that book and yeah, the book by uh, about locutions. Uh, yeah, sure. Those would be a one. wonderful, wonderful topics. I think many Catholics are very interested in, and again, getting our eyes on heaven and our eyes on the, the realm of the supernatural to live that here on earth is a Absolutely. beautiful and important work. So mm -hmm. great. Well, Kristen, thank you. thank you so much for taking time with me today on the program. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. God bless.